Hello again, and welcome to another video. Um, my name is Matt Cervantes, and I am a computer science professor at Butte College. And in this video, I'm going to be talking about the compilation and interpretation process as it relates to computer programming. Um, so basically, this is going to be a walkthrough of how computer programs are actually made. The main point of this video is to is really just to provide some context um, and background about the compilation um, or interpretation process. This is a basic explanation. So there are some details that I'll be deliberately leaving out because I, you know, honestly just uh, don't want this to be a crazy long video. Um, there are tons of resources online if you'd like to learn more, but for the purposes of my class, uh, what I'm going to be going over is more than sufficient. Um, so with that said, let's go ahead and jump in. The first thing I'm going to discuss is something called machine language, or also sometimes called machine code. Um, this is the native language of a computer. When you run a computer program, machine code is passed to the computer's CPU, or central processing unit. The CPU reads the code and then executes the instructions as they're laid out in the code. Machine language is made up entirely of ones and zeros, just like you've probably seen in a movie or a TV show. Now to help illustrate how this works, you can think of a machine language as a file on your computer with a bunch of ones and zeros in it, like you can see here. When it's time to run, the file is passed to the CPU. Now for the purposes of this video, you can think of machine language and computer program as one and the same. Another name for a computer program is an executable, which you will likely hear me say many times in the video. The instructions detailed in the code tell the CPU what to do, and the CPU can then execute those instructions. When computers were first invented, this was the language used by programmers. That's right, the first computers required programmers to write programs exclusively in ones and zeros. Ugh. Unsurprisingly, this was very, very tedious and time consuming. Also, it was very, very easy to make a mistake. As a result, very few people had the skill sets necessary to be a computer programmer. Obviously, this was not ideal. But thankfully, some smart people figured out a better way. In 1952, Grace Hopper implemented the first human-friendly programming language to make it easier to write programs. This was the beginning of assembly language, or also assembly code. Though that's not what Hopper called it back in 1952. So what is assembly language? Assembly language is an abstraction of machine language. Now, as I mentioned, assembly language was the first abstraction invented to make it easier to write computer programs by removing the need to write machine language directly. No more writing ones and zeros. Awesome. Ultimately, assembly language is translated into machine language using a separate program called an assembler. This was revolutionary at the time because it made it way easier to write computer programs. Instead of writing ones and zeros directly, a programmer could write simple commands that had way more meaning to an actual human being. These commands, or assembly language, were then passed to a new kind of program called an assembler, which translated the commands into the appropriate machine language commands. This made it much easier to write programs, which ultimately made it easier to have more programmers. However, assembly language has a one-to-one -one relationship with machine language. That means that each assembly language command has a corresponding machine language output. Because of this, assembly language is still at the mercy of the computer hardware. In fact, there are many flavors of assembly language out there, even today. And each one is unique to the specific computer hardware architecture that it has to run on. This is limiting because code written in assembly can only ever be reused on computers with the exact same computer hardware. Thankfully, more innovation is on its way. In the late 1950s, Fortran became the first commercially available general purpose compiled programming language. So, what is a compiled language? Well, just as assembly language is an abstraction of machine language, compiled languages are, generally speaking, an abstraction of assembly language. Unlike assembly language, compiled languages are not tied to a specific computer hardware though. Also, the language tends to be more high level making it even easier to read than assembly languages are. 
Last, compiled languages are often translated into assembly language, which is then translated into machine language. Now, as a side note, not all modern compilers generate assembly code nowadays. Some compilers will generate the machine code directly, or at least object code, which is not something I'm going to delve into in this video, but I just wanted to make that clear. However, generating assembly is still a very common practice for modern compilers. So, to help illustrate how this works, let's start with a compiled language. Now, I've decided to use C++ because it's really well known, but this same process is true for most other compiled languages. So, after writing the code in the compiled language syntax, the code is passed to a compiler. The compiler compiles the code by reading it and translating it into assembly code. As you can hopefully see in the diagram, the syntax of C++ is a bit more human readable than assembly language. Also, because the compiler is generating the assembly, the same C++ code can be compiled on a different computer using a different CPU and it will still work. This is because the compiler is producing assembly code, which is unique to the CPU architecture of the computer. In the end, the compiler abstracts away the need to know anything about the specific computer hardware, and this is where compilation really shines. So taking a step back, the overall compilation process goes like this. We start with C++ code. This is handed over to the compiler. The compiler generates assembly code, which is handed over to the assembler. The assembler assembles the assembly code into machine code, which is then ready to be handed to the CPU for execution. An important thing to note from this diagram is that the compilation process ultimately results in a computer program, an executable. The computer program can be run by the CPU once, twice, a thousand times, but the language source code, C++ in this case, only need to be compiled once. Once the machine code is generated, it remains as a reusable file on the computer. So, as you can see, compiled languages are great at hiding or abstracting the details of generating the machine code used by the computer's CPU. However, compilation does have its own limitations. One of the most notable of these is the need to recompile a program into machine language every time the program needs to be updated. This can be particularly tedious if compile times are long, which can definitely be the case on a large software project. On a big enough project, compile times can be measured in hours. Lucky for us though, there's one more option when it comes to making computer programs. Interpreted languages have been around for nearly as long as compiled languages. One of the very first widely used interpreted languages was BASIC, which came out in 1964. It had quite a bit of success for many years. In fact, Visual BASIC, Microsoft's flavor of the language, is still in use today as part of their .NET ecosystem. So what is an interpreted language? Well. Interpreted languages are similar to compiled languages by being high level, not tied to a specific computer hard hardware architecture, and easier to read than assembly language or machine language. The big difference is how the language is translated. Ultimately, interpreted languages do not directly use a compiler or an assembler. So let's see how this works with another diagram. We start by writing the source code in our interpreted language. For the purposes of this example, I'm just going to use Python. Now, as you can see, the syntax of Python is really easy to understand. In fact, that's one of its big draws. Now, after the code is written, it's fed to a special program called an interpreter. Like a compiler, the interpreter reads the code that it was given using the syntax of the language. In this case, it's Python syntax. However, unlike a compiler, after each command is read, the interpreter immediately sends the instructions to the CPU for execution. But wait, you're probably saying, the CPU can only understand machine language, right? How can the interpreter do this? Well, unlike a compiler, which reads all of the code and then eventually produces an executable in machine language, an interpreter is the executable. That's right, the interpreter itself is just a computer program. So if the interpreter is a program, what makes the interpreter? Well, in the case of Python and many other interpreted languages, the interpreter is the product of a different compiled language. The most commonly used Python interpreter was actually written using the C programming language, 
However, in this little example, I'm going to use C++. So the code for the interpreter is written just like any other program. It is then passed to a compiler, which is then passed to an assembler, which ultimately produces an executable in machine language. That executable is the interpreter. With this paradigm, the code for the interpreter is never or very rarely updated. Instead, the Python code can be updated and executed whenever needed without ever needing to generate a unique executable. So interpreted languages don't produce machine language. Instead, they rely on previously built computer programs to interpret the language's syntax or the rules and execute commands in real time. This has a few advantages, but high on that list is the ability to quickly update and test the program logic. On the flip side, interpreted languages tend to be less performant than compiled languages. This is because interpreted languages use an interpreter to do the work every time the program is executed rather than having the program logic compiled into machine language, which is the native language of the computer. The act of translating or interpreting the code in real time causes the program to take more time. However, depending on the programming project, it's possible that the performance difference is inconsequential. This is actually why many programmers prefer to write in interpreted languages like Python and JavaScript, PHP, and so on. Interpreted languages tend to let you develop your code faster at the cost of being as efficient as a compiled language. So here are the big takeaways. As a modern computer programmer, ultimately, you are writing instructions that will be translated by another computer program whether it's a compiler, an interpreter, or even an assembler. And as such, your most direct relationship when in writing code is with whatever translation program you're using. Now that being said, your job is to adhere to the syntax of the programming language. If you write code that is well understood by the translation program, it will happily do whatever you ask. But if you don't, it won't. It's important to remember that the code you write is ultimately being passed to a translation program you're not writing logic that will be run directly on the CPU. And finally, recognize that there are different types of translation programs out there, and it's important to understand their advantages and disadvantages, as well as how they work under the hood. Well, that does it for this video. I hope it was informative, and thanks for watching.